think we're on. Okay, well, thank you for uh, uh, coming this morning. Thank you for joining our event. This is a joint event between World Bank and SEPS, and thank you very much uh, for SEPS to agreeing to host us today. The, uh, the topic of our event is the changing nature of work in the EU. Uh, I'm glad to say that we have a very distinguished panel with us today. Um, uh, before I hand off to Daniel Gross, uh, the director for the Centre of European Policy Studies, um, I'd like to introduce also Penelope uh, Kuyanu uh, Goldberg, uh, chief economist for the World Bank. Uh, Simeon Jankov, uh, director and author of the WDR, the World Development Report 2019, and Guntram Wolf, uh, director of Bruegel. So I'm going to hand over to Daniel now. Um, we will then go to a presentation uh, from Simeon for the World Development Report, and we'll go to a panel discussion after that, uh, at which point, once we've finished, we'll have a chance for question and answer session with the audience. So thank you. Daniel, over to you. Yes, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the World Bank for allowing us to host this event. Uh, when we were approached to do this, uh, I could say no because changing nature of work is one of the key topic uh, uh, that uh, the EU should really be grappling with. I presume we will discuss that later, but that is behind uh, many of the political difficulties we are facing at this moment. I don't think I need to enumerate the member countries mm. <laughs> which have uh, slight domestic problems at present. And uh, that is why it's a particular pleasure to welcome you here uh, to present uh, this report. And uh, Simon and I, we already had uh, contact in the past. Um, that was more regarding the Eurozone. But today we have a broader topic uh, not only broader in, uh, in geographical uh, terms, so it's not the Eurozone, but the entire EU, but also I think much broader and much more fundamental regarding uh, the European economy, where is it heading? Of course, all of that uh, in, the, in the global context. And uh, without further ado, Simon, I think you can then start with the presentation. Okay. And apparently my mic didn't work. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, you have to repeat it for the live stream. <laughs> yes, do, but do you need <laughs> maybe a 30 seconds? <laughs> so, to make a long story short, I think this is a really a fundamental topic for the EU, for its economy, but also for its political economy. And I think uh, we see in a number of member countries the problems we are facing with exactly this issue. What is the nature of work? Um, and how can we uh, provide a better framework uh, for the future? Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. The report online, so if you just uh, type uh, World Development Report 2019, um, you have it in several languages. Um, so I wanted just to um, mention a few key findings, but also the motivation behind uh, this reform uh, report. The future of work is, as Daniel just mentioned, uh, a very hot topic in the European Union, but also actually everywhere, even in uh, fairly uh, poor countries. Um, uh, this topic is, uh, is of high uh, political importance. Some countries are hoping that uh, the future of work uh, bodes well for them because they've missed uh, the past of work. And some countries, uh, particularly uh, more advanced countries, uh, including in the European Union, um, are worried about what's happening in, uh, uh, in the future. There's precious little academic research and whatever there is uh, mostly comes from the US and the UK, at least in terms of data. Um, so, as we started working on this study, one question was um, from what we already know from academic researchers, uh, how much of that is actually relevant for other countries, both other uh, advanced economies like continental Europe, uh, for example, but in, particularly, uh, in particular emerging economies, developing uh, countries. And the answer to that question is actually very little. So what we see in the US and the UK uh, actually doesn't, at least at this stage, translate much to the rest of, um, of the world. 
But let me get there by uh, first making the point that uh, when this uh, future of work discussion uh, comes up, immediately people associate it with at least three phenomena. One, uh, and three anxieties actually, one is that uh, robots are replacing workers, so they are soon going to be mass unemployment. Uh, two, that uh, among the workers who remain in place, uh, a lot of them will or are joining the gig economy, so kind of you work uh, on your own pretty much, uh, not in large corporations, not in large institutions, uh, so you work uh, sort of in your pajamas or from an island or um, <laughs> from a farm, um, and that uh, on the one hand can be uh, very nice. On the other hand, it creates a lot of uh, issues of uh, social protection, for example. Uh, so that's the second anxiety. And then the third anxiety connecting the first two is that if there, there is uh, significant uh, job loss uh, due to automatization, and then the gig economy is uh, progressively taking people away from, if you like, formal employment to more flexible uh, but also less secure employment, uh, social anxieties uh, are rising, um, and with that social inequality. Hence, uh, uh, trouble in many, uh, in many countries. We do see, as Daniel made the point, we do see trouble in many countries, so society is being uh, uh, clearly worried uh, that uh, the future is uh, not, uh, not very bright. Uh, but then the stylized facts about how we actually seeing uh, jobs being replaced by, uh, by robots. The answer to that, at least uh, what our study provides is, with the exception of very few countries, including the United States and the United Kingdom, where we do document, consistent with previous uh, uh, research, uh, job losses due to, um, uh, to robots, if you like, most of the world is not in that category. So continental Europe in particular, at this stage uh, anyhow, we document that over the last about uh, a quarter century, 25 years, countries like Austria, like Germany, uh, like Central Europe, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, um, uh, Nordic countries actually still gaining jobs, including in manufacturing. So if you look over the last 25 years, uh, uh, years and to uh, to this year, it's not the case that uh, that uh, robots are replacing workers, or rather they are replacing them in some sectors. But at least so far, these economies manage to adjust and uh, create a sufficient number of jobs uh, in uh, in other sectors. Uh, not the case in the United Kingdom. Not the case in the United States. Um, um, but there is among advanced economies where at least at this stage there is some, um, uh, some bifurcation. And the question is, is this just coming to continental Europe? So is it that US and UK point the future? Or is it that there is something fundamentally different about uh, other advanced economies, particularly continental Europe, uh, that make it different uh, in the future as well? And there are arguments on both sides. Uh, people uh, quickly point out that what is different about continental Europe is much stronger social protection system. So in these transitions from a job to a job, unlike the US where you basically just fall through the cracks and most likely never appear again, <laughs> uh, Europe has a much better social protection system that allows longer transitions, both in terms of retraining, reskilling, finding new, um, uh, new jobs. Is that robust enough? We'll, I guess the panel will, um, uh, will discuss. Uh, but on the first question of are robots replacing uh, workers around the world, the answer so far is no, not really. There are some economies where that's uh, the case. For most of the world, on net, we are still gaining, um, uh, uh, adding, uh, adding jobs with the exception uh, of uh, poor countries. And I'll finish with that. Africa is not really gaining jobs, at least not formal jobs. And that should worry us uh, uh, a lot for a number of uh, reasons. But before getting there, let me briefly mention the gig economy. That's another buzzword in this future of um, work um, uh, discussion that uh, mostly in advanced economies, in some of the uh, larger emerging markets, more and more people uh, basically work um, 
uh, for themselves or as contractors, subcontractors uh, and so on. So in our study we try to document to the extent possible uh, whether that in fact is the case and how many workers, what percentage of the workforce is in fact uh, in this um, uh, category. First we find that the numbers that currently exist are wildly speculative, let's put it that way. So you see numbers from um, uh, actually from many European countries that vary between you know less than uh, half a percentage points to five six seven percentage points uh, for the US sometimes the numbers go goes up to 15 percentage points of the labor force we find that at least now the numbers are very small so on average for advanced economies gig economy um, defined as your main job, not something that you're doing on the side of your uh, regular, uh, regular job, but as your main job from labor force uh, surveys and so on, is something in the order of 0.4%, so less than one half of a percentage points of the, labor, uh, of the labor force in countries like Germany, Austria, the Netherlands are three countries where we have actually very detailed information. US a bit more, UK a bit more, but still not breaching uh, one percentage points of the labor force. So very small still. Doesn't mean that it wouldn't uh, uh, get, uh, get much larger quickly, and there is some evidence of fairly rapid um, uh, expansion. But the rapid expansion is in secondary jobs. So you have some job, and then on top of it, you do something else. Um, uh, so uh, the question is how long can, can this, uh, this uh, uh, secondary job uh, be uh, maintained is an interesting, uh, is an interesting uh, question. Uh, and then uh, perhaps on the facts I'll finish with uh, what I already mentioned is that we do, we do document over the last 25 years where jobs are being created and jobs we mean formal jobs, so where you can basically point out to the person uh, having a labor contract, working for a formal uh, company or in the public, uh, uh, in the public sector. Uh, so net, uh, the world is creating about 40 to 50 million jobs a year, new formal jobs. However, nearly all of these jobs are actually being created in East Asia, not just in China, mm. in Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, some of the poorer East Asian countries India. increasingly, uh, Laos, uh, Myanmar, India, South Asia is becoming more important, but if you take the world as a whole and net out the job losses and the uh, <coughs> job creation, basically East Asia accounts nearly 100% for the job, uh, uh, for the job creation. Um, Poor countries, poor countries in Africa, uh, Middle East, uh, are basically not gaining any formal jobs. Remarkably stable, very low formal um, uh, employment, and in fact, informality defined as people who have some sort of a job, but they're not, uh, don't have a contract, so cannot show you a payslip and say, this is where I work. The share of informality, rather than being reduced, which is what most, um, research uh, until recently has been suggesting is actually rising. Is rising throughout all of Africa, is rising in the Middle East, is rising in significant part of Latin America. Why? Because Not because no jobs are being created, some jobs are being created, but population growth is faster, if you like, than job, job growth, formal job growth. So actually on that, you see informality uh, increasing in, uh, in uh, poor economies. And because of the gig economy, albeit slowly, informality is actually also increasing in rich countries. So if there is one puzzling effect or puzzling finding from, um, from our study, and I'll finish with this, it is that informality globally is becoming a bigger and bigger uh, uh, phenomenon. Why is that uh, uh, an issue? Well, at least for two in two dimensions. One, social protection. If you're informal, um, you have much less or no social protection in terms of insurance, in terms of um, uh, uh, pensions. Uh, and again, this is the case for many uh, emerging economies, but also increasingly for a share of the population of um, advanced economies like the European Union. And the uh, second and final point is taxation. If you have larger and larger share of informality of both businesses and workers, 
they're not paying taxes. So then how is the government going to um, provide social protection? How are they going to build infrastructure, pay for health, education, uh, and so on? I'll stop uh, here. We don't have very good answers in the report for these questions of taxation and social protection. For social protection, actually new technology does allow you hmm. to try some things that in the past were not possible. So rather than uh, give social protection through, through jobs, if you like, you can do it through consumption, knowing how uh, people consume and basically uh, provide, providing some social benefits on top of that consumption. But that's still very exploratory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, well, we'll go to, to a couple of questions. Now, if you perhaps if I can come to you first. As with Timmy, and you've, you've told us that perhaps the threat of AI is exaggerated to some extent. Um, where is that exaggeration coming from? Um, because it seems that the media and, and people are, are, are hearing these messages quite frequently now, and it seems if that's not if that's not the case, and that situation is is exaggerated. Where is this coming from? And also, if we're looking at into the future. Is that not where the threat exists? I mean, we we've looked at you've looked at the last 25 years, and you're looking at now the jobs are being added. But is it really in the future that that threat might exist? Can um, it be come to you? Um. Uh, yes, so I, I was actually going to comment as uh, uh, Simon was talking that, that in this debate uh, that is causing enormous anxiety across the whole world, so not just in Europe and not just in the U United <laughs> States, but also in the developing world, it's really important to get the facts straight uh, because there the, the, the are claims and there the are fears and then the, the facts. And so you will often see in the press some um, grossly exaggerated numbers about job loss associated with new technology and AI. Um, and there is absolutely no evidence to back these numbers. Uh, this is not to say that these trends may not realize one day, but so far we have no <coughs> evidence that technology is eliminating jobs right and left. Uh, I think the fears arise partly from stories and anecdotes that people tell. Uh, based on particular cases, based on particular firms uh, that have outsourced uh, jobs to technology. So they are very valid for these cases, but they may not generalize to the economies as a whole. And partly because people project whatever has happened in these cases to the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we don't know for sure whether this is going to happen or not. But uh, as I like to point out, people talk today about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, this means there were three industrial revolutions prior to this one. And in each case, the, the, the new technologies eliminated many jobs, but they also created many new jobs. And at the time this was happening, it was very hard to foresee where the new jobs would come from. Some, sometimes it's very hard to see into in, the future and figure out what, what developments exactly are going to create the new jobs. But in each case, we saw the economy adapting. and. Uh, I think this is likely to happen again. Sure. So, so l let me let me make uh, perhaps two points in that regard. I mean, um, first of all, I very much agree on uh, sort of the numbers and the picture that you described. Um, we've had some research on uh, the impact uh, of of robots on European employment, and you see very little. And actually, you. You w it would be strange if you saw something. Why? Well, basically because robots are really a fringe phenomenon still. I mean, so global investment into robots is around um, uh, uh, 48 billion if you include all the software and so on uh, associated with, um, with that. The pure robots itself, it's just a third of it. So, so global investment in, in robots is, is very small compared to global investment overall, right? I mean, global investment in capital is, uh, is on a totally different order of magnitude. It's in the trillions. So we have here something that is actually quite small and quite specialized in a few sectors, in a few economies. And uh, I guess the second sort of immediate evidence um, where you sort of realize that perhaps the story is a bit overdone on the robots uh, is, uh, is, is, of course, the country I know best, as we say in Brussels, so, so Germany. Uh, Germany is the country uh, with uh, one of the highest densities of robots per worker uh, in the world. Um, and uh, it actually has uh, the largest employment in manufacturing uh, as a percentage of one of the largest uh, employer shares of employment in manufacturing. 
um, and has full employment, basically, or close to full employment. So, so mm -hmm. I, 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 I certainly entirely agree that sort of the, the prima facie evidence is that, you know, there's not a big effect. You can really, if you treat the data very strongly and you go down to sort of the research by, by Asimoglu and, and Restrepo, um, who did that for the US, and we did that the same, applied the same methodology for European countries. Mm -hmm. If you are lucky, you find a little bit of a wage effect um, in sort of middle scale jobs, right? Mm -hmm. um, but not much, not not much more than that. Um, now, uh, that's that's I guess the first point. The second point is the fear. I think is a real fear, and the fear um, uh, uh, relates to uh, you know what we think about the future, but also relates, I guess, to displacement effects. So, what is uh, important in this research by Asimoglu and Restrepo is that indeed people um, change their job profile because of automation, because of new technologies. That has always happened, I mean, and it's normal that it happens. Mm -hmm. um, but they fear that uh, mm -hmm. now this will be much, the fear is now that this will be much quicker and much bigger. So the research by Frey and Osborne, for example, suggests that something like 50% of our jobs will be affected by digitalization and automatization one way or another. That doesn't mean those jobs will be lost, but it means that the jobs will change, right? I mean, and we all experience that in our daily lives even. I mean, if, if you're a university professor, yes, even a university professor job is affected by digitalization, it's affected by online courses and so on. So, so we have to adjust, and the question is, is the speed um, Perhaps higher than it was before, and and I think that's that's the that that I, I think would would certainly be for me uh, uh, one big question. Now then we can speculate on the future, and uh, you do that a little bit in the report. You know, is AI the big game changer in the future, um, and you know, is is uh, human capital formation the answer? You know, we can have a long debate, but I'm sure perhaps we do that in the second round. I don't know, but uh, uh, but you know, I'm I'm sure that. AI as it is, um, is may eventually become really um, um, a, a very fundamentally changing technology that really fundamentally changes the relation between, let's say, machines and, and humans. And, you know, that raises a lot of anxieties and, there, frankly, there are also some significant risks and we can debate those. But, but that's, I think, a future story. It's not what we see yet. Mm -hmm. So, so if those jobs aren't necessarily going to be lost, they will change the way that we work. Does it mean that there is actually a threat that, or a risk even that it might create more inequality in society um, in terms of how those jobs are remunerated, how important those jobs are, and do they become less important over time? Um, Daniel? Yeah, I think I would actually put the emphasis more on something else, something related to what Simeon said, namely uh, the fact that in some societies uh, the formal sector is not expanding, whereas in others it does. And the use of technology, IT and AI, is very much linked to a formalization of economic relations, whether within the firm or across firms. And uh, what I sense is the, the fear about uh, IT and all these new technologies, not so much uh, about displacement in a sense, you lose, I lose my job and I have to accept something else with a lower salary, but a sense of bifurcation. We have economies which participate in this formalization, which brings higher economies of scale, lower transaction costs, and allows you to participate in these famous global value chains. Both the physical ones in producing of goods, but also intellectual ones, producing software and so on. And uh, as I said, what I fear is a bit of bifurcation between societies which adapt to that, which participate in this formalization, and you mentioned East, most of East Asia. Mm -hmm. And by the way, these are also usually the, the countries or regions which have the best education systems yeah. in terms mm -hmm. of quantity and, and quality. And now, coming back to our uh, domestic ground here, 
if I take uh, the country I know second best, <laughs> <laughs> which is Italy in this case, <laughs> I fear that this is also what we are seeing there. I don't know enough about France. Uh, that we have one part of the country, in this case is also in, in certain regions, which participate in global value change, which are, retain a very strong formal economy, and are actually not doing so badly. Whereas the remainder of the country uh, seems to be excluded from that, uh, both because of local governance problems, uh, low quality of education, mistrust of uh, the authorities, it's a mixture of factors. <coughs> and there the informality um, persists and as you noticed, in, at least in Africa, it actually expands. Mm. Now I mentioned Southern Italy is one example, but I think Eastern Europe mm -hmm. is also contains pockets or paths uh, which go in this direction. And uh, that, in my view, is uh, also because some people feel left behind. And they're revolting against some, some bigger forces which they see, where they see other countries, regions, even firms in the same sector. Some firms go ahead, internationalize, formalize, participate in these value chains, and others are left behind and they think, ah, this is all about globalization. And I think that is, I think, the political problem we are, we are uh, grappling with, but also, the, if you want, the economic problem, which in a certain sense, however, is then secondary, uh, because uh, without, this, uh, without getting on this track of participating in the formal economy, uh, some people see that there's no future, even if today the income uh, inequalities might not increase much. Um, since we are um, showing off which countries we know in Europe, so I'm from <laughs> Bulgaria, so my first uh, best is Bulgaria. Um, but something that Daniel, and actually Daniel knows Bulgaria quite well as well, maybe third best. Um, uh, uh, that's right. Um, so, but um, in Bulgaria, um, there are these maybe two statistics that illustrate, I think, why there is stylized facts that happen to be wrong about robots, but the social anxiety is, is, is increasing and is happening. So when we talk about uh, the fourth industrial revolution, one, one very basic statistic is internet penetration. Well, Bulgaria is actually one of the top 10, top 15 countries in the world in terms of internet penetration. We have fairly good uh, uh, penetration, fairly good uh, infrastructure for that. Uh, and one uh, statistic that illustrates it, that um, slightly more than three quarters of the population actually says that for social media purposes or for news, uh, basically they use daily the internet. So about 76% of Bulgarians uh, basically say on a daily basis they, they use the, uh, uh, the internet. Which you would say, well, that's great. So, you know, we're very connected. We can benefit from... Mm. Um, from the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> then the same survey asks a question, how, how uh, many basically of you, so do you use the internet for your business, for your kind of daily business activity? 8%. So there's 76% that daily use the internet for news, including fake news, um, uh, and, only, and less than 10% that use it for business. So this difference, which is about 65%, one can interpret it as a rising social anxiety. So what Daniel was illustrating. So I see that people, <coughs> some people live well, uh, because I can see them on social media, that they're on vacations in the Bahamas, and uh, they show me their office and uh, uh, what they do, and the fun that they have with new technology. And I can only see it from sort of, I'm in the same country, in a different region, perhaps only 100 kilometers um, uh, away from the capital city. But I see that I live very differently. So that actually increases my, my, uh, my uh, anxiety. It's even more the case if you have this uh, access from North Africa or from, uh, 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 from other parts of the world. But even in the European Union, <coughs> that sort of perceived inequality, and maybe it is uh, over time going to be uh, actual inequality, but you can see it in countries like uh, Bulgaria, and I'm sure many other countries. I mean, even among the rich countries, uh, probably that's uh, the case to a lesser degree. 
and we should worry about that. Uh, but it's not robots per se. It's uh, technology allows you s much easier to see how others live, and you think I'm exactly like them, and yet you know they're here and I'm here. Why? So I wanted to come to that social media question at the end because I thought actually it would be good for the audience, but we come to it. We come on to it now anyway. Um, so are we actually just creating unrealistic expectations for ourselves by whipping each other into a, a sort of frenzy on social media, um, and actually it's self-perpetuating almost? And Penelope, maybe you want to come in on that. Uh, so, so, so certainly, social media and the fact that we can go on the internet and we can see how other people live. Uh, uh, increases the social anxiety, because you can always compare what the living standard is in a different part of the world. But I can also make the other case, namely that also the internet and the social media also make clear what opportunities are in other places of the world. And so we may ask ourselves, why is it the case that people don't take advantage of these opportunities? So, so I, I wanted to, to push the discussion in, in a different uh, direction, and namely, uh, as was pointed out before, what is perhaps different about what is happening today is the pace at which change is happening. Mm. It's happening very, very fast. Mm -hmm. I would argue that what's happening, the, the, the technological change is not fundamentally different, but it happens at a pace which may be too much for humans to respond to. Uh, so it used to be the case that you had one career in your life, you might have to change multiple jobs, but you had one career. So these days, you are expected to change careers multiple times uh, during your lifetime. A and especially for us Europeans who uh, were educated in a very particular way. You go 12 years, you go to school, then you go to, to college, to a university actually, where you get a highly specialized university. You learn to do one thing perfectly. And then after all these years, you get a job, you get additional training on the job. And then eventually you are told, now you have to revamp your life and learn something completely new. This is too much for people. And um, I would argue actually that in the United States it's a little easier because the educational system has always been more open-ended and more flexible uh, with regard to that. So I think what, what brings about this enormous social anxiety is the fact that every few years you have to change your life. You have to, and there is a difference between being flexible, which we all uh, advocate and being constantly on your smartphone and trying to find the, the, the next gig. Right? The, 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 the last co causes enormous anxiety and that's, uh, I think that's where the social unrest comes from. So, so one more comment on the issue of informality because I think this is very closely related to. Actually one point the WDR makes and I thought, I thought it was very interesting and I fully agree with that is that the new technology has made it so that there is some uh, convergence between developed and developing countries on the issue of informality. What do I mean by that? So informality used to be a phenomenon that was specific to developing countries, to poorer countries. And what we mean by informality is the presence of the sector that's A, invisible to tax authorities, small firms that don't pay taxes, workers that don't declare, who don't declare their income, but also you know, the set of workers who may have temporary arrangements with firms, who don't receive benefits, and so on. Um, that used to be specific to developing countries, uh, not to developed countries. Now with the new technologies, with, with um, all the new applications, the sharing economy, we see many informal work arrangements arising also in developed countries. So uh, many of the new companies, the small companies, are visible to the tax authorities, so that they are not informal in the, in the same sense that they are in developing countries where they don't pay taxes. But still, the workers who work for them take Uber workers or Lyft workers or TaskRabbit, all these, uh, all these people who work for these uh, new tech companies, they don't receive benefits, they don't have job security. Uh, the future is not certain for them. Uh, and uh, again, you can, you can have two views on that. If, you, if it's your secondary job, if you have a primary job and you need some additional income, it's great to be able to provide a few hours a week as an Uber driver. But if this is your primary job, it's a source of enormous anxiety. And there you might say the worker today in a, in a country like the US may be very similar to, to a, a worker in, uh, in a developing country uh, where there are no benefits and no job security. And so on, on an optimistic uh, side, you know, if, you, if you look at these issues from the point of view of developing countries, you might actually think developing countries may have an advantage because people have been used to living this life much more so than Europeans or, or even Americans. We are used to having, uh, 
to, have, to, to, have, to, to having job security, to having made some investments early on, on in our lives and then seeing these investments uh, provide their fruit. Um, in developing countries, this is not taken for granted. So, so, so you hear people talking about the potential of all developing countries to leapfrog into the future. I, I think there may be something to it because people are coming from this mindset where you constantly have to adapt. You, on, you constantly have to find the new gig. So they may be actually well equipped to take advantage of this new world that we live in. Um, so we, we've heard that the informal, the gig economy, it, it, it makes you a lifelong learner, but it also creates a huge amount of anxiety. And uh, you know, on balance, where, where, do you, where do you stand on this? Well, I mean, let me uh, let me perhaps echo and and add uh, to a few points uh, of my my pre uh, pre pre speakers. Uh, so, so one is this issue of informality. Um, uh, I, I would, I, I guess, the first point I would make to a large extent globally, informality is, of course, not a result of technology. I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenon that exists for many reasons. But I think where I do agree is, informality, uh, technology, platform uh, working, platform work, makes informality easier, and makes it, if you wish, somewhat more formal, right? Because um, you create, uh, I mean, it's, you create at least some mechanism where you do it. And certainly in, in many emerging economies or low-income economies, it's actually a great way to, uh, to actually uh, uh, make money, right? Instead of, instead of sitting uh, and, and selling, I don't know, um, you know some products on a, on a physical market, um, you actually have access to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, platform work where you can contribute perhaps even better work than you, than you could uh, otherwise in the informal sector. Um, in developed economies, uh, I think I, I entirely agree that um, this is a new sort of segment of the labor market, which is quite informal, which is typically low wage. I mean, so the wages, uh, wage levels are very low um, um, on platforms. So, so an Uber driver uh, and so on typically earns much less than uh, than a formal worker. Um, and I think it's important to understand that there is really, as of yet, no way really to capture that in the welfare state. I mean, so our welfare state, the continental European welfare state, uh, tends to be uh, centered very much around uh, well, uh, a Bismarckian model, which is sort of very much related to work, right? So, so you have a formal work, mm -hmm. and in your formal work, uh, your employer and you together, you pay your health insurance, your pension, uh, your social security, everything is deducted from your formal work. And, um, and you know, the alternative model is sort of this more, let's say, a more beverage kind of uh, welfare state where, um, you know, the, the welfare state is much more paid out of taxes, and taxes are much more broadly um, uh, uh, charged on, on income. And it seems to me, and, and on all kinds of income, perhaps including capital income. And it seems to me that the discussion we need to have on, uh, on the continent in Europe is, it's not so much whether to prohibit uh, uh, platform works, I think that would be stupid, I mean, that is coming. I would also warn against sort of forcing platform work to become formal work because mm -hmm. it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. But what I do think uh, we really need to put a focus on is can we raise revenues as a state from different sources of income, including platform income, but also capital income, and so on and so forth, to actually fund our welfare state. And I, I think that's the direction we should be going. And do you think then actually the gig economy is almost performing the the role of a welfare state? Are people actually using the gig economy to, to provide themselves with a basic income almost uh, on top of their formal role? Well, I mean, it's a low wage income, right? So it's basically when you don't have a, uh, if your main job doesn't, doesn't feed your family, um, which I think is increasingly the case and which is a problem which, which people I think object to, uh, and that's the inequality issue that we are discussing also, right? I mean. 30 years ago, uh, a single income would fund an entire family. I mean, that is not possible in many cases nowadays. So, so people have not just one job, they have two jobs, and you know, so they try to sort of uh, make money here and there. But I think mm -hmm. it's actually a problem that, and it relates probably to the falling labor share that we are seeing mm. in some economies. So, so I think it's much broader than the technology question that we are discussing, I mean, the point that you're raising. Daniel, uh, I think you mentioned that, that technology is really facilitating the informal or the gig economy and not actually providing the sort of evolution of 
or hasn't been the reason for the, the, for the gig economy coming to the fore. Um, is, is, is the gig economy actually something that was born out of the financial crisis, the economic crisis, particularly in Europe, um, that people needed to find work, there were high levels of unemployment, and actually this informal arrangement worked for both employer and employee? First of all, sorry, I would uh, make a sharp distinction between two types of informal, informality. The one that Simon and I, I think, refer to is uh, a way to operate when you have informal relationships uh, between suppliers, uh, clients, uh, no relationship with the government. Mm. and. Uh, there, my point was that as soon as you have, let's say, apply IT technologies, it leaves a trail. And it requires most relationships to be somehow formalized. And what I had in mind is if you want the following. You had uh, small sweatshops in, in Naples producing shoes, right? <coughs> Quickly and in small numbers. Today, uh, what you are, is needed is somebody who can actually produce a particular shoe at a particular color and size when somebody in a shop somewhere else in Italy pushes a button, right? I need this model and I need it tomorrow, right? But that means that the, uh, the supplier has to be connected, right? Electronically has also have then connection with other sub suppliers to get all the parts and all that becomes traceable and formalized, right? The small sweat shop doesn't pay taxes and doesn't pay social security, then can no longer compete on that. And I think that's the part of the economy which is losing out, and the people in that economy, just the workers, but also if you want the entrepreneur, they feel that they are being disadvantaged by quote unquote globalization. And then there's this other informality, the, 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 if you want the jig economy, people working as Uber drivers and so on. And there I would be quite relaxed. I think this is just a way to have a fringe, and I think you said, or Penelope said, that actually numerically it's not very important. Mm -hmm. It's a fringe in the labor market which provides some needed flexibility at the margin, which we did not have. A particular interesting episode uh, regarding, for example, Uber, I find is uh, there is some research where people have looked at actually the uh, sociological composition of Uber drivers in Paris. And it seems that most of them come from the banlieue. And that was a nice job for them, getting a nice car, right, uh, a nice dress, and uh, being somebody. And for this type of person was actually the only way they could get a job. Now, do I call it the formal economy or informal? I would say it is, for me, formal still, since it's all traceable uh, according to certain rules, uh, the drivers are screened and, and all of that, right? So it is perhaps a working arrangement which is not X hours per week, but I would classify it as still under the, the, the formal economy and uh, I don't see this part exploding or providing a particular anxiety, perhaps except to taxi drivers who are competing. Mm -hmm. um, so as I said, I has really distinguished between this flexible working within a system which is all IT based and therefore traceable and formalized, and the part which was totally informal or informal and therefore cannot compete uh, with this uh, structured systems which arise through the uh, increasing use of, uh, of IT. Okay. Do you want to come in on that? Um, actually, to go back to um, <coughs> a point on um, taxation. So new technology allows us to indeed uh, trace many more transactions that we, uh, that we used to and that sounds like it's good from a public finance perspective but then that's an area where somehow public policy still trails uh, technology mm -hmm. so yes we can uh, at the individual level or the example that Daniel was saying yes it's probably true that we can trace a lot more now 
but somehow um, customs offices and tax offices are not either not using this data or don't know yet how to use this data or more likely don't have yet uh, policy based uh, the laws and regulations to be able to use it. Uh, which is why we see uh, in a number of, uh, of countries uh, and in also by large corporations, you see how the tax burden for these platform companies is much, much smaller, an order of magnitude smaller than, if you like, a standard, uh, a standard corporation. So it's not that we don't see what, let's say, Google makes or Amazon makes. We, we have an idea of uh, how much money they're making. But then the fact is that they pay much, much less money than, you know, um, IKEA or, or some companies like, uh, uh, like that. And this, this may be an additional reason for why social anxiety uh, is coming, because now you can blame particular companies and say, see, these are the companies that um, make multi-billionaires, and in the meantime, we, uh, we uh, suffer. So somehow, uh, and this is part of the report, perhaps the least developed part of the World Development uh, uh, Report uh, study, we document the phenomena that new technology allows corporations, but also wealthy individuals, more easily to hide money. Uh, not necessarily to evade, to avoid, to say, well, you know, my research and development facility is in the Bahamas, and the Bahamas happen to have zero tax on research and development, this is actually a very large corporation that, in fact, has a research and development facility in the Bahamas. If you don't believe me, tough, because, you know, I, I play by, by, by the rule. So traceability is one thing, how to create the tax uh, uh, rules, um, and they have to be global, at, at least at some, uh, at some level, to be able to capture this uh, uh, for public financing. Otherwise, yes, we can think of Bismarck vis-a-vis -vis beverage and move more towards uh, an income-based uh, uh, system. But if a lot of income uh, leaks, sure. how do we go about it? Okay, I, I want to change direction slightly, actually, to come on to the income. Um, the WDR, the World Development Report, advocates for uh, universal basic income. We've seen a few countries looking at piloting that. Um, is it a realistic option? Is it actually achievable? And you mentioned tax collection being a challenge. Um, in the current environment, let's look at <coughs> European countries. Is that a realistic solution, uh, Penelope? Uh, so I have to say I'm quite skeptical. Uh, so first of all, the concept is, is not new. Uh, it's been proposed many times uh, centuries ago. Uh, but second, uh, we need to uh, give a lot more thought about how exactly this would be implemented and most importantly, how it would be financed. But conceptually, if you think about it, what universal basic income is, is a combination of two ideas. So one idea is that you provide some minimal support to the poor. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's a, it's a poverty targeting program, but there are many such programs uh, all over the world. And there is a, an enormous debate on, on how exactly to do that, whether it's best to, do, to, to provide unconditional cash transfers or conditional cash uh, mm -hmm. transfers or food stamps or cash. I mean, this debate has been going on for many, many years. And uh, there is no consensus that there is only one way that, uh, that dominates everything else. So that's, that's the first part, that's the first idea, which is provide support to the poor. And then there is a second idea um, behind this program, which is make it universal. So you offer this money to everyone. Uh, but there we really have to ask ourselves, so are, in the United States, are we going to be giving $10,000 to Bill Gates or uh, Bezos? Uh, I mean, obviously not. We're going to make some distinction who needs this money more than other, th than other people do. And once you go down this road, then it becomes a redistributional tool. And if then, if you think about redistribution, there are, again, other ways to do that. There is the question of optimal taxation. Mm -hmm. So then, again, these are questions that have been investigated for many, many years. Um, so it, it seems the idea sounds appealing, but actually, if you dig deeper, it's not, it's not clear what's new, why it would work, and why it would dominate other, other ways in which we can support, in, in, in which we can provide social protection. Um. Um, so is it, 
Good chairman. So is is it feasible? Is he, is a UBI feasible without actually having to, to to raise taxes or slash the current benefit system in a in a country? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a very big question that you're raising, and I think I think we already heard um, from Penelope the, um, I mean, the complexity of the issue. I mean, it seems to me um, uh, that we still continue to want to have a system where, um, I guess, work at some at some uh, is is somehow incentivized, right? So, um, so, so that's why um, I mean. Conceptually, I think of this. I mean, there's the poverty part, which uh, I think is important, but then there's the, the, you know, the part. How does it relate to work, right? And, and conceptually, I tend to think of a universal basic income more as some sort of a negative income tax for low low salaries, right? Mm -hmm. And if if you think of it in that term, in that terms, I think it's actually uh, also an old idea, and I think it's actually an idea that, as an economist, I would tend to think would work, right? So so. So you, uh, instead of having a sort of a marginal tax rate that goes to zero at a certain level, and then basically you, you start sort of handing out um, uh, food stamp programs or whatever, you, you really have a marginal tax rate that you know, crosses uh, the zero line at a, cer a certain level and becomes negative the, the less income you, you make on, uh, with, with your work. And, and I think such a such a system we we have that or, or we have already elements mm -hmm. of such a system. Of course, I mean, in France there are elements of um, uh, support for uh, minimum uh, minimum wage um, uh, jobs, uh, so that support is given to the company, so that they actually employ um, at the higher levels. So so you know we have I think we have a sort of a mix of all kinds of systems uh, across Europe, um, and every country has very complex mix of systems. Um, and uh, sort of just imposing on, on this very complex system a minimum, uh, uh, um, I mean, a universal basic income uh, certainly is, is not the way forward. I think what we need is we need to seriously think about income distribution and what to do about the low, um, the low, the low income jobs. And there, perhaps the way to go is a negative income tax. Dan, do you want to come in on this as well? Yeah, I want to. Uh emphasize implementation. I think that's really the key problem. Again, the country I know second best. Uh, they're discussing in Italy the introduction of a minimum income. And uh, now what about the incentives uh, to work? Uh, of course, at the level of the law, you say you have to accept a job, and if you refuse two of them, out. But how do you implement that? Exactly. You have to have a vast administration. Uh, which has to be able to follow millions of people and actually see whether the jobs which uh, they perhaps offer them are appropriate or not. Uh, in Germany, part of the Hartz reforms was a massive revamp of the Agency for Work, which had hundreds of thousands of people. And actually, uh, part of the reason why the new system in Germany worked was because that agency was able actually a, to, to find jobs for people, or to say this person with this qualification maybe could be used here and there. And that was also able to follow up and say, if he didn't accept that job, maybe because he didn't want it. And there were some uh, reports in the German press that uh, the agency actually hands out millions of fines per year, or um, fines, but also saying people, look, you really should do something. And that requires a tough administration. Mm -hmm. Now, I have uh, difficulties uh, imagining the same procedure in, let's say, some parts of Italy. And then comes back the second, the informal jobs. Somebody with an informal job, which is outside the visibility of the authorities, um, what do you do with that person? We treat it as if he didn't have any, any job. So uh, for me, uh, this uh, guaranteed minimum income is something for a rich, uh, well-ordered society. It's a luxury good, mm. but I would really, much, uh, really, very much warn against trying to use that approach in uh, countries where informality is still uh, important. So I, I, I just want to, to offer one qualification to what I said before. Uh, where I think I would slightly disagree with you. Uh, 
So, so, so first, I think we need a, an awful lot more research uh, into this issue before, before it can get implemented. Uh, I think that's for sure. But I always thought that this idea of a universal basic income might make more sense in a poor developing country where there is no social protection system at all, if, even if the jobs are informal. And I was thinking there have been actually experiments funded partly by uh, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs in Kenya in small villages where they give people uh, a basic income and then they see how their lives evolved. And they found that this basic income made a huge difference in their lives. And there is anecdotal evidence, again, coming mostly from uh, sociologists, not from economists, uh, of people saying, that I remember there was the, the anecdote of a woman who said, I received this income and that allowed me in Kenya, that allowed me to build a fence around my house so then the foxes could not eat my chickens. So I didn't have to, to worry that I will have no chicken. <laughs> uh, and this made a huge difference in my life. I could sleep at night. I could you know, cook food for my family without having to worry about these things. So there are these stories that people tell where it seems to make a huge difference in the lives of the truly poor. So I thought in these countries where you have no social protection at all, in contrast to, to Europe or the United States, where you have something. So if you have absolutely nothing, giving, giving a basic income so that people know that their basic needs are taken care of, that might actually go a long way. I, I'm saying that with a great deal of uncertainty because as I said, we need much more research into the issue. But to, to me, it had, the idea had more appeal for, for that part of the world. Daniel, I think you look keen to come back on that. Yeah. I'll come to you. Yeah. Uh, very briefly, that might very well be true. But maybe what comes out of that is sort of you firm relationship. Yeah. Uh, the very best, uh, at the very top, uh, they can allow themselves the luxury, and at the very at the bottom, very bottom, right, this might be uh, just necessary for the survival and also to allow people to do some minimum basic investments to get themselves going. Mm -hmm. But I have my doubts for those in between. Just maybe two, two comments on this. Um, in our study, uh, actually, this was the first time that uh, since the World Development Report is kind of an, the official voice of the World Bank group. So um, uh, when we said that we're going to cover the topic of universal basic income, there was uh, hue and cry both from the supporters and from the opponents. Um, um, uh, basically saying that whatever you come up with, uh, it's not going to look at the wide variety and subtlety of our client countries and uh, so on. So nobody is happy at the World Bank that, um, that we uh, covered that. Um, but the group that was least happy, and that surprised me, is actually labor unions. So I expected that the <laughs> split would be left-right, like in most issues. So the left would say, I mean, left meaning the political spectrum left, would say this is a great idea, the World Bank should support it and put it everywhere, and then the uh, right of the spectrum would say this is a ridiculous idea, it's never going to work, um, it's redistribution, communism, and so on. But actually the labor unions were the ones who sent lots of lots of messages to all sorts of um, mm. executive director and the president and saying this is outrageous, that without enough analysis the World Bank gets into this, and so on. So I was puzzled at first, but then it came to this issue. So why are the labor unions so upset about it? Because if it did work, then you don't really need labor unions because you have this universal <laughs> basic income and then uh, you have a fundamental level. If it worked, I actually don't believe in universal basic income, but if it worked, then in some sense it provides kind of uh, the type of uh, safety net uh, um, for, uh, for workers or for the population that you don't need labor unions. So that was quite interesting to see the labor unions going together with the far right uh, economists and saying this is a ridiculous idea and so on. But more substantively, and I'll finish with this, so there are only two countries that we know of. So we just summarize, we don't mm. take a view actually, we just say this is what, this is the countries that have tried it, or the regions, and this is what happened. So there are only two countries in the world so far that have tried nationwide uh, a version of universal basic income, Iran and Mongolia. So I was recently in Italy and I was asking the question, do you want to be the third country? So Mongolia, Iran, you, Italy, like is this the, 
the uh, three of that you like to be uh, part of. So both in, and it's quite instructive in this country, so why did they do it? Because they had money from natural resources, gold in the case of Mongolia, in the case of Iran, uh, oil. Uh, and at the peak, as it turns out, of both um, uh, of uh, oil or gold prices, their countries decided, what a great idea, politically very popular, let's do it. Um, both uh, programs got bankrupted within less than a year and a half. So in the one case about uh, 12 months and Mongolia was bankrupted, the program. In the case of Iran it lasted a bit longer, but still less than a year and a half. Why? I think for both what Wolfram and what Daniel separately was saying. So first the incentive to work once you have that diminishes for people who are just, just around the margin. Plus, on top of it, they say, so now I'll game the system, I'll get that money, and I'll work informally. So in the case of Mongolia, which is a small country, um, you would think that they can count their population and say there are so many people who, who we have. Something like 40% additional population showed up to claim the benefit. So they <laughs> miscounted by 40%. Why? Because I think this region, this, this reason, you know, now I'll game the system. I was formal, but making some money which is just above, let's say, around what they're giving me, I'll now turn informal. So I show up, get the money, and then continue um, working on, uh, on the site. So if there is a lesson in, in our study, is that it costs a lot more money than countries like Italy, for example, uh, anticipate now. So it also causes a lot of behavioural problems by the sound. It causes a lot of behavioural uh, problems, both just how to game the system, and then there are some other studies, including in rich countries, that say, I'll get it, but then actually I get depressed, because work, we haven't discussed this here, what do I do if I have so much time? So, okay, so I go on vacation twice, and then what else do I do? So alcoholism actually increases tremendously in the group of... Uh, people in countries like Finland, Alaska, I mean, states that have tried this. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to go to questions now. We've got about 20 minutes. Um, if you can give us uh, your name and organization, and uh, there, is, there should be a microphone. You can have mine. Um, no, come on up. This gentleman down there. Gurt Geisert from Backbone Consulting in Germany. I have a remark about the study of the World Bank. You mentioned uh, you focused on uh, Germany, uh, Austria, and the Netherlands. Of course, this is not the average of continental Europe. One example, these are exactly the three countries where you have the dual system of education, parallel education in enterprises and in firms. It's a big success. Young people have at the age between 20 and 25, after the education they get proposed, we discussed this in Italy. In Italy, people are very hesitating uh, to take over only elements. But by contrast, uh, the recent event of uh, Bruegel, uh, Mr. Wolf, uh, a Chinese diplomat asked me about the dual system of education. <laughs> and he wanted to know a lot, to know a lot. And it would not surprise me that they do a pilot project or something. Thank you. Mm. I think this system is vastly overrated. <laughs> I'm not saying it's bad, but 15 years ago, with the same system, Germany was a laggard. Right? Uh, this system, at present, in the present conjunctural cycle, um, is useful for Germany and Austria. Um, it is also a system which makes people less flexible because they get very specific human capital. Mm. So I'm not so sure that 20 years from now we will still sing the hymn to the dual system. Um, so as I said, it is useful in certain circumstances for certain types of industries, mm -hmm. mm. but to say that this is the solution to youth unemployment, mm. I would disagree with. Sorry. Uh, question down here. Yeah. Yeah, and I did my thesis uh, in the master program about the universal um, basic income and the effect on gender equality in Germany and Austria. So I was really motivated at the beginning because I thought it was a new idea and I was looking into it. 
And then it turned out that there is a certain risk that it becomes a housewife money, so that women are less motivated to participate more in the labor market. So that's what mm -hmm. I wanted to mm -hmm. add in this issue. And I think for the uh, labor unions, just one aspect, if you want to finance it, I guess you have to cut some expenditure, for example, for social protection, and that's where the red lights come up at the labor unions, exactly. I guess. Mm. Very good. No. 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 no, that's a very good point. Oh, a good uh, we'll point. take another question that's well, at the front here, and then we'll go <coughs> to the back. Oh, let's go to the back first. Um, a question not related to basic income, but um, to what do you see as the role for research and innovation? We can hear you. Uh, to smooth the transition. Uh, do you see, sort of like, um, for example, that you know, different programs could be initiated on your Perhaps for the web streaming, you should repeat the question. So it's what programs we need to, to put in place for the transition. Specifically, Specifically research and education. Well, the research and so maybe. Well, I mean, I, I think the report very much talks about human capital and education. And uh, there I would perhaps push back a little bit. I mean, I, I, I think it's, very, of course, everybody says it's, uh, that's the magic bullet and we need uh, education and, uh, and better human capital. Uh, but uh, but I, I do think, especially on the more forward-looking part, right, uh, if we think about AI and, you know, really these kind of... Um, very new technologies that will actually compete um, and that are already increasingly competing with um, high skills. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, so, I mean, just to give you the IBM, IBM's Watson, for example, um, I mean, does take over the services that um, trained lawyers do by now, right? So, so I mean, they, they screen emails and basically allow law firms to employ less junior lawyers because basically they, they can, can, instead of you know, having human capital basically reading the emails, you now have, um, have artificial intelligence doing that. So, so this notion that human capital can, can uh, uh, be the solution um, and that everybody becomes uh, sort of so creative um, uh, that you know, he will be doing the creative things that, uh, that, uh, that AI cannot do, um, I think we at least I would put a question mark there. You mm -hmm. know how how strong that effect will be, be, and you know how how successful that strategy in the end can really be. I think it's very natural to have doubts, um, but but again, you know if we if we try to take lessons to draw lessons from the past, I think there has been. Uh, yeah, a trajectory of uh, skill increasing over time. So thanks to technology, manual labor has been replaced by machines. So little by little, people are moving up the skill uh, ladder. Uh, uh, I agree that it's very hard to see how exactly technology can generate enough jobs of high skill to replace all the tasks that potentially can be replaced by machines. Uh, so, so I, th that's precisely the reason that we see so much anxiety. But I also think that what's truly special about research and innovation and technology, they, they, they t historically they have created paths that were totally unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I realize it's not a very satisfying answer to say we, we actually don't know, but that's precisely the yeah. nature of innovation, sure. that there is a future that we may not be aware of. Sure. If I can just add, so what human capital, uh, so some additional human capital, uh, I think, uh, is needed, but exactly which skills and how to teach it, and how much of it is fundamental research, how, how much of it is applied research, how much of it is just basic literacy and numeracy, the point that we mostly make in the, in the World Development Report, which links to my uh, this puzzle, if you like, that East Asia is getting on net all the jobs, so nothing is going below East Asia, and you know, 
basic economics uh, would have suggested that you know as wages are increasing in China and other places we should see Egypt and Nigeria and Ethiopia and a few other countries benefit uh, uh, in terms of job but that's not happening so the question is why uh, East mm -hmm. Asia and not others and Daniel I think made made that point early on so at the fundamental level, not research and development, uh, but at the mm -hmm. fundamental literacy and numeracy, given their income per capita, East Asian countries right. are real outliers in terms of sure. uh, good education. They also, by the way, most most of them outliers in infrastructure, basic infrastructure. So they have this this combination, you could argue, between fundamental skills uh, and uh, fundamental education, I mean, and infrastructure, and perhaps that's why jobs are not really going to Africa, to the Middle East, to parts of uh, Latin America. But at what level you need this, uh, exactly. uh, this uh, uh, skills? Uh, at least in our study, we don't have a satisfying answer. Thank you. Uh, we had a question down the front. Are you still interested? And we'll go to the back as well. Thank you very much, Tomas Barini from the European Commission. Um, you kicked off the discussion by saying that the only countries where you actually found net job losses were the UK and the US. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that since, you know, especially the UK, it's a mostly service-based economy. So I was wondering whether the job losses were still in the manufacturing sector in these countries or whether the fact that the services are very strong had a, an effect on that. Yeah, so there are, there are a few other economies uh, that, uh, that are uh, experiencing job losses, but these two are the uh, two obvious uh, uh, ones where indeed sorry. the... Job losses in industry or overall? In, in industry, sorry. So they're losing, uh, relatively speaking, a lot of uh, jobs in, uh, in industry. In Both countries are adding jobs in services. Uh, but not enough, so to speak, uh, to, um, uh, so labor participation is falling after going up. I think you mentioned that as a phenomenon also in other European countries, but uh, after about six, seven decades, at least in the United States, of labor participation rising, mostly because women are uh, entering the labor force in the US, in the last decade or so, actually labor participation is falling, and not just by... Uh, women but actually by males uh, as well. The UK the same actually. The last decade labor participation is uh, uh, is uh, uh, is falling and that's masking some of the um, trend that I'm mentioning that uh, these economies are losing um, uh, a large number of uh, manufacturing jobs. Here and there, there are the economies as well, so I'm not saying that these are the only two, but among the advanced economies, these are the two that consistently um, uh, you see, uh, you see that you may know about Europe, or Daniel. W what is the situation in Europe well, in terms? Actually, we can document continental to Europe. To Europe, yes. Trend what are the Europe is there? An <laughs> <laughs> uh, increase in the uh, labor force participation rate over the last 20 years, which is now higher than the US. Mm. And actually, we did some uh, work on this uh, in house some time ago. Um, one half of that is actually due to a simple fact, which is that uh, the level of education of the population is increasing. And it's an empirical fact that uh, the labor force participation rate of those with tertiary education is usually around 80%, but in all OECD countries. Mm. Whereas higher. those with less than secondary is around 50 with huge variations. So if you get 20 percentage points of your population from the very bottom to the very top, Mm. you automatically get a big increase in labor force participation. Plus, we have seen a particularly strong impact on the, uh, of the labor force participation rate of the elderly, which is, of course, related because, as we maybe a typical professor, 60, 70 years old, can actually continue. Somebody who has uh, laid bricks uh, might no longer be able to do so. Right? Yes, yeah, so I, I want to uh, add something, uh, especially with reference to the U.S. So manufacturing, the manufacturing, the share of manufacturing has been declining, but overall, unemployment is at a 50-year low. Uh, the, the labor market is overheated in the U.S. and companies cannot find people. So I, I think these are things that we should keep in mind because people are talking about job loss and disruption and displacement. 
but the aggregate numbers don't show that. So there are jobs. The question is what kind of jobs, right? So, so and, and this is the question. And, and what where kind of, as and well. Where and what kind of, are these jobs perceived as satisfying? Mm -hmm. But but it's not a, a question, it's, it's not, we, are, we, we don't live at a time of mass unemployment. Um, I am allowed. Uh, one more quick one on the platform economy. Um, and I would like your reaction uh, to reflect because some recent uh, studies, and you have touched upon it, uh, have shown that a lot of platform economy in the developed countries are actually being carried out by employees at the developing economies. So in a way, it's, it's not the same uh, labor uh, market regulation or social security issue that you would normally face in a, in a developed economy where you have your uh, workforce and then you need to think about what to do about social security, about their, their quality of jobs, but that's in a way a bit of a different issue of international national trade and maybe right. a kind of import of labor. So maybe that would deserve a bit different thinking in, in the way that to distinguish the, the amount of platform economy really within the country and then the, the way you import and how you address the issue. And then the second issue is uh, linked, a second question, uh, linked to uh, the debate of automation. And uh, I think you have touched a, li a little bit on it already, but I would uh, benefit from your insight uh, much more. Uh, when looking uh, uh, more into the uh, drivers and a little bit uh, away from the uh, towards the demand side, to job creation and the way jobs and, and, and firms organize the work. Um, we have seen in the past and, and right now that in different countries, while you have technologies for decades that allow certain uh, automation of certain jobs or certain tasks, if, if you wish, but only in a limited number of countries and limited number of industries, you have actually seen the realization of this automation potential. And this potential is not something new uh, in, in the coming last five years or 10 years, in the 80s, in, in the 70s, you had a lot of automation going on, but in a very limited number of countries and industries. And therefore, my, my question would uh, go into this uh, more driver, so sort of, or reflection um, that uh, industries and countries uh, need or general forecast of this automation, it's really to take into account the, the capability and interest and rationale for investment and, and the cohesion debate that we have in the EU that you don't have the investment, the companies are afraid maybe, or there's no uh, business rationale to really invest to automate or to enhance the organization of, of jobs. So I, I would be really interested to hear also in that uh, the demand and, and the work organization aspects of the debate. Thank you. Someone want to come in on the first question? Well, I mean, just just very quickly on the first point, I think you uh, you point to uh, to um, to a real issue, which is basically that platforms make it even easier than before to uh, trade services um, across borders, right? I mean, so 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 even before we could do that, I mean, as you know, call centers um, have often been uh, sort of and are often organized that that you know people sit in India and uh, and answer your phone here. Um, platform economy <coughs> makes that even easier, and as we also pointed out, it's still a relatively small phenomenon. But you know, in principle, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, this um, this could uh, mean that the pressure on on wages um, will uh, will increase further because you know, basically, the computer. I mean, so 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 it's a way of in in a sense, it's a way of. Uh, reducing the difference between the tradable and the non-tradable sector, right? Because the non what what used to be non-tradable sector um, becomes smaller, right? Because through the platform economy, we can trade things we we previously could not, um, and and that that lowers tends to lower lower wages. If if you really think there's lots of abundant people out there that can do the kind of jobs that. Um, we also can do, and where we have some qualifications here in the developed economies. So, so, so I, I fully agree with what was said, and, and you know, several times during our discussion, people pointed out that this uh, platform economy, this uh, task-based economy, is still very small, and I agree. But the potential is there for this type of economy to take over completely, precisely because you can. <laughs> You can trade services now across places and across borders. The fact that this has not happened yet is, 
is to a large extent, in my opinion, due to the fact that trade in services is highly restricted for a good reason. If it were liberalized, the world would be a different place. And so we are, we are going about it very, very carefully. But, but imagine a world where every service can be bought from a different part of the world on a, on a contractual basis. So you don't need to have uh, a law firm. You can buy law services from a different, from a different place. Uh, universities, teachers, you know, you can, you can buy educational services from anywhere. I mean, it, it could completely revolutionize, revolutionize the way we do business. This has not happened yet, but the potential is there. And uh, I think the fact that it has not happened is precisely because policymakers and labor unions and individuals are aware of, of how dramatic the consequences uh, would be. And to a certain extent, I would say the same about automation, that uh, people, so, so my background is in trade. And whenever someone says something against globalization, the answer is always, well, why do you complain about trade and not technology? And, and my answer is people do complain about technology. And the fact that we don't see more automation is precisely because people are worried about the effects that automation might have on their lives. And they've decided to proceed carefully and slowly. And so that's perhaps one of the reasons we don't see more automation in some parts of the world where automation is feasible. Now, there are also other parts of the world, developing countries, where they either don't have the know-how or the resources to automate, or simply wages are low enough that there is no reason to automate. And, and by the way, uh, you know, in the spirit of, of uh, in, a, in a self-serving spirit, you know, let me advertise the next uh, World Development Report, which is going to be on global value chains. And there we are planning to touch on some of the issues that Daniel mentioned, namely, can developing countries still enter the world trading system if they have to meet compatibility and quality requirements and so on? Um, so uh, the reason I thought about that is because it, it's related very much to your second question. Do we want to automate? Wh why is it that some countries have not, or some industries have not participated in automation? And one answer is in some sectors, in some countries, the wages were so low, there was no reason exactly. to do that. Mm -hmm. But now uh, that we see the price of capital going down, the price of machines going down, we have robots, uh, maybe the, the pressure to automate will increase. And if that's the case, is there still a future for developing countries and for global value chains? Or will we switch to a world where automation rules? And uh, people are replaced by machines, but not just in Germany or in Belgium or in the United States, but also in Pakistan and Bangladesh mm -hmm. and, and uh, Africa. And uh, there, the, the, the consequences could be much more dramatic, I think. We have a question down the front, and then perhaps one more uh, to finish, if we, if we have time. Uh, Hi, I'm Oral Banerjee. I'm also with the World Bank. Uh, but uh, I wanted to just uh, ask the challenging panel a bit on the, um, the story on the fact that jobs haven't increased, but there is tension. Part of the work that we have done, as uh, uh, Simeon and Penny uh, know, for the European Union is a group called Growing United, which addresses some of the same issues. And there we replicated the author Osimoglu uh, work on the task content, content of jobs right. for the countries of Europe. And what you see in Europe, if you look at the data for all European countries from 1998 to 2014, then you do see that the demand for types of job have changed, even though the net amount of jobs have not changed. What's happened is that jobs that are intensive in higher order cognitive skills have increased roughly by 15% over this period across almost every country in continental Europe, Eastern Europe and Western Europe, while manual and routine jobs, uh, the jobs that are intensive in those sorts of skills have declined by an equivalent amount. So, I'm just offering mm -hmm. that uh, as a question to the panel, that that may be the story, right? Um, just linking it up to an earlier point made by Penny. Um, yes, every previous industrial revolution has found new jobs in order to replace the ones that were lost. The question, which is really important, I think, for us to, uh, to get a thought from you on, is how long was the transition period and at what cost? Mm. Um, and that is the question that you have to think about. If you think about the beginning of the 20th century, 
in the last Industrial Revolution, that transition period was roughly 30 to 40 years but before the new types of jobs and new economy overcame it. It led to the birth of the social protection systems that we know of today. Mm -hmm. And the question is, are we prepared in today's world to actually look at these, and especially in Europe? So it might be interesting to get some non-World Bank <laughs> views on that, actually. Um, so Daniel, if we come to you first, and then Guntram, perhaps you can yes. enlighten us. When I hear these uh, figures, I always ask myself, is that a supply or a demand phenomenon? Mm. As I mentioned, it's, we noticed that. As I said earlier, the skill composition of the European workforce has increased exactly to make that possible, right? To bring that about, question mark. So a lot of the discussion we have about technology is, in my view, in the first instance relevant for the countries or industries or regions at the frontier, or close to the frontier. Most of the world is very far from that. <laughs> most of the rest of the world is very far from that. I presume most of your World Bank clientele, uh, we didn't even mention India, I would be interested to see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. India and China, these are the, the giants in terms of populations, where just if you get to the frontier anywhere near, you transform lives. Right? And then the second one is for, for the Sweden and Finland and the coast of the United States, perhaps, of, of interest. But also for most of Europe, I come back to that, there's so much more we have to do just to get the basic human capital skills uh, and the basic uh, technology infrastructure in place before we have the luxury problem, I think, uh, of uh, seeing whether we need more cognitive, cognitive skills of one type or another. So I would say let's do the basis first and then we can see for the rest. No, I mean, I, I broadly agree. I, let, me, let me just perhaps add, add two things. I mean, I, I think the speed point that you're making, uh, I, I started off by, by making also that point. I do think there is an issue with speed and you know, speed seems to be higher now than it used to be. And that causes more uh, uh, stress in the labor force. Now, the second point I would make is, um, I, uh, and that's going back also to our initial human capital uh, discussion, I, I still think it's an illusion that we think sort of everybody will eventually become a high cognitive skill worker. I mean, I think this will not, we will not reach that goal. Um, it may be desirable and we, we, we certainly want to have basic training and we want people to have numerical skills and so on. But there is a reality out there which is that, you know, uh, there is a distribution of skills in, in population. You shift that distribution a bit, but you will still have a significant part of the population, you know, that will not have this kind of skills. And so, so I do think we have a real issue, substantive issue, where we have to think about what do we do with uh, those people that eventually will be left behind and do not have the capacity to adjust. And you know, it seems to me that this discussion needs to be needs to be done. And that's why I think the the World Bank report is an excellent contribution to push that debate. Thank you. I think that's a perfect endorsement <laughs> to end on. Um, <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming out. I know it was a brisk morning to take a walk down here. And thank you to our panelists for giving a warm hand. Please.